Good morning. How'd that first homework set work out for you? It's different, different than other courses. So, all right. Well, today what I want to do is to start talking about Chapter Four about organic reaction mechanisms, and we'll spend four lectures on it. We'll talk today sort of in general. I'll try to talk about factors influencing reaction rates, how temperature and other factors influence reaction rates over the next few lectures, substituent effects, isotope effects. Um, and so we'll try to understand how people learn about mechanisms. That's half of the chapter. The other half, and you'll get, I've assigned 10 homework problems. Five sort of have to do with probing how reactions occur, and then five have to do with um, writing curved arrow and radical reaction mechanisms and trying to understand sort of basic mechanistic processes at maybe a little bit more uh, sophisticated level than sophomore organic chemistry. So I want to talk a today about how we how we probe reaction mechanisms. And I'm going to start by writing a reaction that I don't know the answer to the mechanism on. So let's take a look at the reaction of the following compound. Let's take a look at the reaction of this tosylate, phenethyl tosylate, and benzene thiolate. Remember, pH is a benzene group. And we'll look at it. It's a, a displacement reaction. And the product of the reaction is going to be thiophenol will replace tosylate. And we'll get tosylate as our leaving group. And just in case you don't remember, OTS is a shorthand for the toluene sulfonate, sulfonate group. It is a good leaving group. It is formed from the corresponding alcohol, or at least can be formed from the corresponding alcohol. So the question I'm going to pose is, how can we determine the mechanism of this reaction? And more specifically, is it SN2 or is it SN1? And I don't know the answer to this question. We won't know the answer, but we're going to look at how we would approach it. And the reaction, by the way, would be done in some sort of solvent, and it would be done in a solvent that dissolves polar molecules and anions, so probably ethanol would be very typical. So the reason I don't know the answer to this question is there are plenty of good reasons to think that this reaction might occur through an SN2 route, there are plenty of good reasons to think it might occur through an SN1 route. And we're going to talk more about these, but an SN1 route involves formation of a carbocation. It often occurs with very stabilized carbocations, like tertiary carbocations. We all learned in sophomore organic chemistry that you never get SN2 reaction at a tertiary center. And we also learned in sophomore organic chemistry that primary centers are particularly good for SN2, and you essentially never get an SN1 at them because a, an SN1 reaction involves a carbocation, and primary carbocations in general are very, very unstable. And so, of course, I've set us 
right in the middle. I've given us a secondary carbon here in our example. In other words, a carbon with two carbon substituents attached. So we're teetering right in that in-between region. We have a phenyl group here that is good at stabilizing carbocations by resonance. So that might help SN1. But at the same time, we have thiophenylate and sulfur anions are fantastic nucleophiles. They'll do SN2 reaction in situations when many other species might not be nucleophilic to participate in SN2. They're very polarizable. They're not so basic. And so we have something arguing for one, something arguing for the other. All right, let us take a moment to talk about what we mean by these processes. So SN2 means substitution nucleophilic bimolecular. In other words, in an SN2 mechanism, and I hope by now you're all good at drawing curved arrows, in an SN2 mechanism, your thiophenylate anion has electrons that it can go ahead and attack the electrophile. So it can attack your tosylate. And it can come in and kick electrons onto, and I guess I'll write it over here, onto the oxygen of the tosylate. And we can kick out the tosylate leaving group. That would be an example of a reasonable reaction mechanism, a reasonably written reaction mechanism. Now, I want to bring us back to concepts of how reactions occur. And you can think of a reaction as involving going from reactants to products and crossing over an energy barrier. In other words, we can write a potential energy diagram where we have something like free energy, let's call it G naught, or you can think of it as energy if you don't want to think of it as, uh, as free energy, on the y-axis, and we'll have a reaction coordinate on the x-axis, and this reaction goes. It goes, it's downhill in energy. So we are going from our reactants to our products, and going downhill. And in the process as I've written it, in this bimolecular process, and bimolecular means something very special. It doesn't just mean that when I write a balanced equation, there are two molecules on the left. SN1 reaction also has two molecules on the left, and whether this is SN1 or SN2, we write the same balanced equation. But the question is, how many molecules are involved in that point of reaction, in that transition state? And in the case that I've written here, where one molecule is attacking another molecule, the nucleophile is forming a bond to an electrophile, we go through a bimolecular process, two molecules coming together. And so we could write that something like this, where we go over some energy hump. That energy hump would be delta G naught, double dagger. If you want to be, be good um, 
good about this. We could also recognize that we're going downhill. That's delta G naught. We're going downhill in the reaction. And this point here, this fleeting moment where the reactants are coming together is not a stable species. It's not an entity that exists for any time. It doesn't exist for a microsecond. It doesn't exist for a picosecond. It exists for a femtosecond, a fleeting bond vibration or thereabouts. And that point is that point at which we have all five entities around the carbon at the reaction center. In other words, our nucleophile, our phenylthiolate, is coming in. Oops, I guess this is a methyl group here, so I'm going to change that. Our tosylate is going out. In other words, our nucleophile is attacking. Our leaving group is leaving. We have essentially, and I've tried to represent it as best as I can here, a trigonal bipyramidal arrangement. We cannot, as a stable entity, have 10 electrons around carbon. We cannot as a stable species. So this fleeting species where we have started to take a bond and form it to carbon, and we've started to take our positive charge off of the phenylthiolate, and we've started to break a bond from the carbon to the oxygen and started to put our negative charge on oxygen. This fleeting species is the transition state. We can, often you will see it written in brackets. Often you will see that little no, notion of double dagger to remind us that that is the transition state, sort of like a little, little uh, telephone pole or a double dagger. So there's our bimolecular nucleophilic displacement process, our SN2 process. Let's take a look at the pathway of the hypothetical SN1 process. As I said, I don't know how this reaction proceeds. I don't know whether it's SN2 or SN1. And one finds this out by experiment. One finds this out by looking for hallmarks of one process or the other. All right. SN1 means nucleophilic substitution unimolecular substitution nucleophilic unimolecular. And so in an SN1 reaction, the first step, indeed the rate determining step, is that our leaving group leaves. So we have our tosylate. The tosylate leaves with its pair of electrons. we get a carbocation. The carbocation is an intermediate. It doesn't last a long time, but it lasts more than a bond vibration. It lasts more than a femtosecond. It might last for a nanosecond, probably more like a microsecond, maybe a millisecond. But it sticks around for some time longer than a vibration. It is a discrete intermediate. In the SN1 process, the nucleophile then intercepts the carbocation, forms a bond to the carbon atom, like so. And now we form our product. All right. 
So now we have a very different situation for our free energy diagram, for our potential energy diagram. I'm going to abbreviate this reaction coordinate because I don't like to write too much. And so we still go in a downhill reaction from reactants to products. But now we have a discrete intermediate that we stop at. And that discrete intermediate is our carbocation. And if you think about it, there are really two transition states here in this two-step process. Each discrete step has its own transition state. In the rate determining step, in the first, in the first step of the reaction, the formation of the carbocation, we have a transition state in which we have, are breaking this bond, we haven't yet broken it all the way. We've started to break the bond. Negative charge is building up on the tosylate. Positive charge is building up on the carbon. So this is our transition state one. And then we have a second transition state where the nucleophile is coming in and attacking the carbocation. And so that transition state is going to look something like this. Now, our understanding of reaction mechanisms is not handed down on tablets. Our understanding of how reactions occur came from experiment. It came from the fact that people doing experiments made observations and eventually were able to put into a framework how reactions occur and how there are different types of reaction pathways. And these types of experiments involve looking at isotope effects, looking at effects of substituents, looking at isotope tracing, looking at stereochemical course of reactions, and these are the types of effects I want to consider, and looking at the kinetics of reactions. And these are the types of effects right, I want to consider right now as we address the question, how would we determine whether this substitution reaction is SN2 or SN1? All right, so one question that we could ask is, what is the stereochemical course of the reaction? In other words, supposing we start with an optically active tosylate. And by optically active, I mean that it has either, it is either enantiomerically pure 
or an anti-americly enriched. From a practical point of view, this would mean you could see that it measures plane polarized, it rotates plane polarized light, or you could go ahead and do some of the other techniques that we talked about, like chiral chromatography, in order to be able to say, okay, we don't have a 50-50 mixture of enantiomers, we have a 90-10 or a 100-0 mixture of enantiomers. If the reaction is SN2, then you would expect an optically active product with inversion of stereochemistry. So in other words, I arbitrarily draw, drew a product with a wedge to the tosylate, meaning that our stereochemistry was S here, right? This is an S stereocenter. I could have chosen R. And so we would expect an inversion of stereochemistry. We would expect the product where now our stereocenter had inverted at the carbon, and since sulfur and oxygen outrank carbon in its in Kahn and Gold Prelog rules, this would happen to be our stereochemistry. What would happen if the reaction was SN1? You get a racemic mixture, you get an optically inactive product. And so that's one example of a simple experiment where one could discern between two mechanisms. Now, technically, there's one more experiment that you have to do if you get an optically inactive product. Anyone know what that experiment is? To determine that it really is SN1. Kinetics is another, we'll get into that, but there's one more experiment you have to do in order to show that the loss of optical activity is occurring in the reaction. What else could be occurring? How else could you be losing optical activity? The product is miso, which it's clearly not, so for this exact example. Uh, could elimination, happen? elimination could happen, and that's a great example. Some process could occur by which the reactant first racemizes. So elimination would be an example. So for example, let us suppose that either we first, we go from here to here and then back, and I'll draw a little wiggly line. In other words, that we dissociate, we eliminate, we get the alkene, and then the alkene recombines. That would be the alkene plus toxic acid, and then toxic acid re-adds. Or that this ionizes, and recaptures, and we lose stereochemistry. So if you really wanted to do this reaction in the laboratory and you saw an optically inactive product, the one other thing you'd want to do is also recover some unreacted starting material and check that your starting material isn't racemizing. 
In other words, you'd stop the reaction part way through and analyze your tosylate for loss of optical activity. All right, so we talked about and about rates, and that's another great way to look at this. I picked some nice homework problems that give real examples with real data and allow you to see the data with all of its warts. But we'll talk in generalities here. OK, what are the kinetics of the reaction? So let's start by putting it in simple terms. What happens if you double the concentration of the reactants? So in an SN2 mechanism, the mechanism is SN2. That means that two molecules are coming together in the transition state. And so your rate equation should look like your rate is equal to a rate constant. We'll call that K times the concentration of your tosylate times the concentration of your benzene thiolate. In other words, doubling the concentration of either reactant doubles the rate. If I double the concentration of tosylate, the rate doubles. If I double the concentration of benzene thiolate, the rate doubles. If I double the concentration of both reactants, the rate quadruples. There are good practical implications for this if you're trying to speed up a reaction in the laboratory and get your reaction to run quicker. In many cases, running it more concentrated makes it go to completion faster. If the mechanism is SN1, And the first step is rate determining. Then, remember, that's the ionization step. That's the tosylate coming off. Then we see a very different situation. Then, of course, doubling the concentration of, of the tosylate doubles the rate. But doubling the concentration of benzene thiolate has no effect on the rate.
In other words, the carbocation forms in the rate determining step, and then it always reacts with benzene thiolate. Whether you have a lot or a little, it reacts quickly. We could put in a competing nucleophile and see now if we can partition between the two, but the rate is not going to change. So how would you like, in experimentally do this? Would you just add an extra or like double the amount of them and just take the two in between? Or? Absolutely. So how would you do it? So one way would be double the amount and do a time course. TLC is not that quantitative, so you'd probably use another technique like uh, gas GC would be one, gas chromatography. Who's used that in the sophomore lab? GC. And that's an easy way to do it. Or you might do NMR. And remember, on all of these reactions, what we're talking about, your rate is equal to the product as a function of time. So you would graph a graph for concentration of product, so d product d time. So in practice, you would go ahead and have some way of measuring your concentration of product. And you would do this as a function of time. And you would end up taking a series of time courses. And sometimes one does this in a special plot. So say for first order kinetics, you can plot one over concentration of product and expect to get a straight line that corresponds to the rate constant. And sometimes what people will do will be carry out pseudo first order kinetic experiments where let's say, let's say we were looking for SN2. I might do the reaction with 0 0.01 molar of tosylate and say a large excess like 10 equivalents, 0.1 molar of benzene thiolate. Look at the rate. I might then do the reaction with 0.1 equivalents of benzene thiolate and do it with a large excess of tosylate. And then I get pseudo first order kinetic uh, conditions where I can see, OK, are we behaving as if we are first order in tosylate? Are we behaving as if we're first order in benzene thiolate? So that's an easy way to do it. Other questions? I just have a question actually back to regarding the formation of an atomic mixture with SN1. Do you ever observe um, that maybe like after the displacement, so with an off balance state, one, uh, like the leading group will interact somewhat with the carbocation and make it so it's not a purely atomic mixture? Or like ah. Yes, yeah, so you're, yes, excellent question. So we are, of course, approaching this as if it's black and white. And there are cases where you get what are called ion pairs, where the, although the bond will be broken, the carbocation is intimately in contact with the leaving group. And in that case, exactly, now we may be in that gray land where even though the rate determining step was breaking the bond in a tight ion pair, now the nucleophile may end up coming in on the opposite side. And so you may not have complete or even partial racemization. And at some point, it gets to be really subtle distinctions on this. And one of the reasons I gave this as an example of an alcohol solvent is that it's a dissociating solvent that tends to stabilize the ion. So we did this in ethanol. Great question, really insightful. And by the way, reaction mechanisms and discussion of reaction mechanisms has gotten vicious. There have been vicious fights in the organic chemical community over is this mechanism going by a so-called classical carbocation, like we drew with a discrete species, or is it going through a non-classical carbocation where you have some other arrangement of carbons and delocalization of the positive charge? And so these types of, types of battles over subtle issues have 
you know, really trying to push and understand the limits of reactivity and structure and bonding, they can get to be quite, and have gotten to be, quite dramatic. All right, another thing we can look at is substituent effects. What are the effects of introducing substituents? In often, this is particularly true for aromatic rings, Often the substituents are introduced in the para position because it is sterically removed. It won't interact with the reacting center and yet electronically involved. So you can probe the electronics of the transition state and of the reactants. Paramethoxy is very electron donating. Paranitro is very electron withdrawing, and these are some of the prime candidates. So if we go ahead and compare, say, the paramethoxy tosylate versus the plain phenyl tosylate, so the paramethoxy versus the plain phenyl, if the max mechanism is SN2, is SN1, then we expect a very big effect on the rate. The paramethoxy should be much faster. In other words, the reactions going through a carbocation intermediate so here's the methoxy compound. We're going through an intermediate where we are starting to build up a positive charge, a delta positive. And remember, it's an uphill reaction. Uphill reaction means that your transition state is late. It's beyond the halfway point in the, trend, in the reaction coordinate diagram. That means that your transition state is starting to look a lot like the carbocation product. That's a manifestation of what's, or the carbocation intermediate. That's a manifestation of what's called the Hammond postulate. The Hammond postulate says if a reaction is way uphill, to get there, you've got to be almost all the way there to get to that high energy point, the transition state. That, react, that transition state is going to look a lot like that next step, a lot like, in this case, the carbocation. So in other words, we're starting to break this bond. The methoxy group provides a special stabilization for the carbocation, I'm just going to write one extra resonance structure. You can write lots of them, but here's one extra resonance structure that shows how that methoxy group provides special stabilization. The POME, the electron donating POME, stabilizes the transition state and helps facilitate the reaction. If we go back to our reaction free energy diagram for this reaction, and we go reactants and products, and here's our plain intermediate, here's our intermediate carbocation without the electron donating group, and here's our, elect here's our carbocation with the alternative, the POME group, now that's more stable. And so if you look at your energy diagram for the original reaction, I think I had a big hump. And then we go down, and this is delta G double dagger. But now if we do the same thing, if we look at the same diagram with the paramethoxy group, and I'll just try to draw it over here. Maybe I'll draw it as a dotted line since I'm 
doing two things on the same, same curve. Now, this delta G double dagger is much lower. We have a much lower activation energy. And we would expect a dramatic effect, in this case, many fold faster rate. Yeah? So I'm just curious, um, if a resonance structure, if you uh, have a resonance structure such as why you have to break aromaticity, would it be a very minor resonance structure? Or? Ah, great question, because implicit in this is that this is one of our other resonance structures. And I'll draw in the hydrogen here. I'll be a good person here. Not always a good person. Sometimes I'm a very bad person. So I will draw these two resonance structures. So it is part of one part of the other. If I had to say how much it is, I'd say maybe it's 70% this and 30% that. But that's enough to lower the energy. So you're right. The, our, the resonance energy of benzene is very big. It's 36 kilocalories per mole. We pay a price for giving it up for this quinone type of resonance structure. But conversely, the energy of having an incomplete octet is very bad. By mixing it up and spreading it around, remember, this is not one, it's not the other. It's not that they resonate or vibrate or oscillate between them. It's both at the same time. And that resonance structure ends up helping to stabilize. And of course, there are other resonance structures too. But this is the special one that the methoxy group contributes. Now, we see a very different effect if the mechanism is SN2. So if the mechanism is SN2, then we have both of our nucleophile and our electrophile in the rate-determining step. And our rate-determining step, or rather our transition state, looks something more like this. The transition state for the rate-determining step looks something more like this. But we're not really building up much charge on the reacting carbon in this particular transition state. And so we're going to have little or no effect I'll say PLME on the, on the electrophile. There's little or no effect on the rate. Now conversely, if we had put, I said methoxy is one of the biggies, nitro is another biggie that's used. Nitro is a strongly electron withdrawing group. I'll draw it out. If we had a nitro group there, now that nitro group is destabilizing to a carbocation, so the paranitro compound would react much slower in an SN1 reaction. But conversely, a paranitro group wouldn't have much effect here in an SN2.
And by the way, those sorts of differences are often the differences between whether you can keep a compound in a bottle as a stable material or not. So for example, I suspect that it would be very hard to keep on the shelf for a long time a bottle of the paramethoxytosylate. And conversely, I expect that it would probably be very easy to keep stable on the shelf for a long time, the bottle of the paranitrotosylate. Meta has a smaller effect because it is not conjugated directly. You can't write one of those resonance structures. So people do, and you'll see as you go to Hammett equations, you'll see what are called sigma values for um, paramethoxy, metamethoxy, paranitro, metanitro. And we'll talk a little bit more about that or get it in the problem set. All right, the last thing I want to do then is take a, a look at what are the effects of substituents on the nucleophile on the rate of reaction. And I'll take that classic example of the paranitro group. And we'll compare the paranitrobenzene thiolate versus the benzene thiolate. It's a lousy S here. All right. So the nitro group is very electron adjoined. And as a result, the paranitro compound is less basic and less nucleophilic. because the negative charge is stabilized by resonance. And we'll just write out, I want you to get in the habit of being able to think your way through these types of resonance structures. So I will just write out the two important, most important resonance structures for the nitrobenzene thiolate. So in one, we have the negative charge on the sulfur, but we get a special stabilization where we can push the negative charge down, push our electrons over, push our electrons over and again it's one of these sorts of quinone types of resonance structures and you know I'm going to be a good person I'll put all of my lone pairs on the oxygens here to help you out and help you see that special stabilization here. Probably about probably two pKa units difference, so that's a, a big effect. Two pKa units because it's a log scale. I don't know the exact number, but I'd say about two. That's about a hundredfold less basic. So you'd expect to see a big effect. So if the reaction mechanism is SN2, then the reaction of the p nitro compound would be slower.
good bit slower, much slower. But conversely, if the reaction's SN1, it doesn't matter. The rate determining step has happened. The carbocation is formed. It's just waiting to get trapped. It's going to get trapped in a microsecond. If the reaction is SN1, I'll try to write it parallel if the mechanism is SN1. Then the reaction of the, then the p-nitro compound will have no effect. because the formation of the carbocation is, rate, is the rate determining step. All right, well, that's a little bit of an introduction to reaction mechanisms and how we can distinguish reaction mechanisms apart. We will continue to discuss chapter four and substituent effects, isotope effects, and, um, and rate effects as we go through on Wednesday. You can hand your homeworks in to Stan and Sebastian. They have a box for you to put them in and then we will get them back to you in discussion section.